everybody. Welcome to the Film for Fans podcast, the podcast from movie fans for movie fans. I am your host, Ryan Dunleavy, joined by my co-host, Rob Dunham. What is up, people? Ah, yes. Well, uh, we've got an excellent show, and Rob is waiting to get his his due cred for uh, for his his movie calling prowess for this week. So uh, we will be talking about, of course, the box office results. Uh, what's opening this week? We're going to bring back movie philosophizing and a segment we're calling movies, but not movies. Things that are kind of about movies, but kind of aren't. You'll see when we get there. And of course, our watch list. All right, Rob, let's get it over with. Starting now with the box office. Thor Love and Thunder took over number one spot. And if you remember, if you were with us last week, we, Rob and I decided to guess as to the amount this film would gross domestically. I picked 125 million. Rob picked 150 million. Rob wins. The amount is 144.2 million uh, in Thor Love and Thunder's debut. It's an excellent debut for Thor Love and Thunder. Uh, Minions, The Rise of Gru took home number two with a very respectable 46.1 in its second week. That's crossed the $200 million mark. Uh, Top Gun Maverick, still at $15.5 million, has made $597 million domestically. This movie is going to cross $600 million domestically. It's incredible. Uh, Number four, Elvis, 11.2 million. And Jurassic World Dominion at 8.6, which has um, pushed that one above the $350 million platform. Rob, congrats on your win on Thor Love and Thunder. What do you make of the result? Uh, I, I'm not surprised. I was ambitious with uh, where this would end up. And it didn't quite get there, but it got pretty close. Yeah. Um, and I I did think that there would be a big reception for this movie because I think it is, along with Spider-Man, probably the two biggest Marvel properties. Yeah. And you could argue Guardians of the Galaxy might hold similar kind of weight, but I don't think even that would get up to um, what Thor did. And they were a part of this movie, so maybe that had something to do with it as well. Um but really, this uh, and, and so I'm not I'm not overly surprised. I think a lot of people have been looking forward to this as the major Marvel movie they were um, excited about this year and yeah. probably over the next last few years, um, more so than Black Widow or Doctor Strange. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the only thing that comes close would be obviously um, the S- Spider Man movie. Yeah. which had a had a huge result too um but yeah a lot of people have clearly connected to this so i do think a lot of people connected to not just the character the thor character but also to the style artistic vision um of uh, taiko atiti also mm-hmm. um and i do i think that there i think the marketing for this movie was done really well because i also think that probably some people were intrigued by the uh um, Lady Thor, Mighty Thor concepts, mm. um, because uh, people do like Natalie Portman. I, I think that she's a draw, yeah, um, for, sure. for some people. So, I think overall they just did a really good job of um, selling this movie. Mm-hmm. And so, people who are always going to see it, watch it. Then I think some people who probably may not have gone out to see it also went out to see it. Um, you have any thoughts on Thor? Um, basically, a lot of echoing what you had to say about it. Um, I think this was always going to be one of the highest grossing ones for Marvel. Um, they don't have a ton of marquee properties left after they kind of retired a bunch of them slash they killed off the characters. Um, and, and the combination of Thor being a popular character, along with, uh, YTD, the director, um, everything that they put out with uh, Thor and the marketing was all excellent. Uh, so not, even though I picked a little bit less in the box office, I'm not terribly surprised that it's at 144 million. Um, 
it'll be interesting to see what the drop off looks like next week um, to see how long of a, of a run it has, but I think it'll do quite well. Um, I'm guessing it doesn't get to where Spider Man got to. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to come in short of Spider Man, but it will absolutely, it will get uh, significantly more than um, Doctor Strange did. So, um, yeah, looking, I, st- I still haven't gotten a chance to say, it. I'm hoping to see it tomorrow. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's just been that kind of week. So, <laughs> yeah, I actually did get a chance to go see it. I saw both it and Minions. So, I saw the top two. Nice. Nice. And uh, number three, uh, Maverick just continues to impress. The, we were mm-hmm. talking about this before the show that um, as of today, it actually passed the $600 million mark. It actually is in the $602 million, which brings it um, past Titanic as the highest grossing domestic movie Paramount has put out in 110 years of making movies. Which is incredible. And uh, further incredible is in the same article, I saw a little tidbit that Tom Cruise's contract for this movie stipulated that he got 1% of gross revenue from the movie. So he has already made $100 million from this movie. That'll work. <laughs> and he is now the, se- that is the second highest amount personally that someone has ever made from a movie. And he asked me before the show if I knew who had the top grossing amount from a movie. And I would not have guessed. I might have potentially guessed this actor at some point, but yeah. definitely not for this movie. So. so it was Bruce Willis from The Sixth Sense back in 1996. Is that correct? Made $114 million, which is bananas. It's absolutely bananas, especially for 1996. Yeah. And adjusted for inflation, someone posted uh, it would be a hundred ninety-four million dollars today. Yeah. So that's almost twice what Tom Cruise has made. <laughs> if you adjust it, an incredible contract uh, Bruce Willis got on that one. <laughs> yeah, really, he really saw, interesting. He saw a lot of dead presidents. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Let's, let's see where we're going with this. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's a domestic box office. It's really interesting. You have top five. You had four. Have four movies that have made uh, over a hundred and forty million dollars, and one movie in Elvis that will by the end of this weekend will probably be at a hundred million dollars. So that's really really fascinating. Uh, But opening this weekend, speaking of the box office this weekend, uh, there's three movies that are coming into box office. Um, None of them are giant releases, uh, but uh, all will have some kind of niche audiences. Uh, The first one comes out is Where the Crawdads Sing. And this is based on the best-selling novel. And it's about a woman who raised herself in the marshes of the Deep South, becomes a suspect in the murder of a man she was once involved with. And this is uh, Daisy Edgar Jones, uh, Taylor John Smith, Harris Dickinson, and David Stratham are your main characters in this one. Uh, The second one is Paws of Fury, The Legend of Hank. And this this is a kid's animated movie. And it's about Hank, a lovable dog with a head full of dreams about becoming a samurai, sets off to search for his destination. And this is a lot of big name actors voicing it. Michael Sarah is playing Hank. Samuel L. Jackson is Jimbo. Ricky Gervais is Ikachu. And Kylie Kuioka as Amiko. Mel Brooks is also in this one. And George Takai, Gabriel Iglesias. Lots oh of- my! Lots of, yes, oh my. Michelle Yeoh, Jimon Hansu. Yeah, big cast for Paws of Fury. And finally, it's Mr. Harris. Um, Mr. Harris goes to Paris. So that's uh, that's something. And uh, this in is this one stars uh, Jason Isaacs and Leslie Manville and a Chancellor Rose Williams. And it's a widowed cleaning lady in the 1950s London falls madly in love 
with a couture Dior dress and decide that she must have one for her, one of her own. So there you go. Uh, so you have something for uh, a wide variety of audiences. Rob, what do you make of the three entrants this week? And uh, which one is, uh, which one would be your favorite? To go so see? I think I'm probably most likely to see uh, Pause of Fury. Mm-hmm. My kids want to see it. But I would also say that out of the three, it's probably the one I most want to see. Yeah. Um, I like Michael Sarah. He makes me laugh. And this <laughs> movie looks like it's going to be ridiculous. I've seen several trailers for it before other movies I've taken my kids to. In mm-hmm. fact, before we saw Minions this week, um, it happened to play twice in a row in the theater we were at. So <laughs> that was interesting. Sit through a two minute trailer and then see the whole thing again right afterwards. Yeah. Like, I think I saw this like, uh, 90 seconds ago Mm -hmm. um the other thing that's interesting to me have you been following this story around where the crawdads sing at all um not entirely i i i'm vaguely aware of the story but i'm not yeah no the uh, the author is wanted for questioning in a murder that took place where she and her husband were living in the country of zambia uh back like 30 years ago that has eerily similar characteristics to a murder that takes place in the book interesting which um there was recently an author who was arrested for um an author who wrote the book called how to murder your husband that was Mm -hmm. arrested for murdering her husband Mm -hmm. so it kind of seems like this might be a thing with authors that they just kind of write books about the people that they murder yeah yeah that's a a a new genre (laughs) yeah a new so genre of true yeah, I think there's some intrigue around this movie and book because of that going on right now too. Well, then you had, uh, of course, you had the O.J. Simpson "If I Did It" book. Yeah. So this really is this really is a uh, this really is a trend. I really need to read. I, I got that at a book sale one year. I really need to crack that one open <laughs> down and read it. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I. I, I agree that I think Paul's of Fury actually does look interesting and really funny. Um, it seemed from the trailer that there's a lot of comedic uh, action in this. Um, and, and I think you're going to see a lot of, a lot of playfully making fun of uh, Kung Fu stereotypes, mm-hmm. uh, Kung Fu movie stereotypes, which I, which I think would be pretty funny and pretty cool. Um, I'm slightly intrigued with where the crawl dads sing. I do like murder mysteries and and depending on how they're done um so we'll see about that um it, i'm a little bit more intrigued now that i know that this might be like an autobiography from the author yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what to make of that but it is what it is uh so yeah i would say that i do not have interest in mr harris goes to paris i must say sorry not not my thing um my wife would probably be very intrigued about it, but uh, not not my not my cup of tea on that one. Uh, so you've got lots of lots of movies out there. Uh, box office is plenty of things for everybody. So if you want to see the movies this weekend, how about it? Uh, now we will move on to our discussion, and uh, the first discussion topic will be movie philosophizing. We've done this a couple times before. It's where each one of us will pick a movie or a specific scene from a movie, and then we analyze the philosophy behind it and talk about our thoughts along those lines. Um, so, Rob, you want me to go first? Or you want to go first? Yeah, you can go ahead. All right. Uh, so this is I'm I'm picking a particular uh, scene from Inception. Of course, because eventually one has to go to Inception at some point when we're talking about movie philosophizing. Uh, So the quote specifically from Inception, it's when they're talking about uh, the idea of Inception itself and and wanting to plant the idea in someone's mind. Uh, And the quote is this, an idea is like a virus, resilient, highly contagious, And even the smallest seed of an idea can grow. It can grow to define or destroy you. And it 
it is really, really interesting quote. And it's really interesting thought. I was reading another book uh, that made me think of this, uh, this past week. And, and it, it's, it's talking about the idea of story and it says the story we hold at any given time shapes our perceptions, hopes, and expectations. It gives us a place to stand. And that idea of of ideas and the story we tell about ourselves and the story we tell that we're living out in our lives defines the world we're in and the opportunity that we have we're constantly at a war for our minds in terms of what is what do we let into our minds how do we it's not just what happens to us it's the story we tell ourselves about what happens to us that really makes a difference. And that was an idea that I think Christopher Nolan brought to a head with the idea of inception, that you have to be very, very careful about what you put deep into someone's mind. Because when you put an idea there, it can come to define who they are. It can come to change their entire world, their entire perception about things. And I think not not many of us uh, fully take on that idea that what we put in our minds really does have a dramatic impact on the on what shapes our world what shapes how we how we view the world and how and what we live in and i think that's something um in in terms of biblical philosophy where where it would say like take captive all the thoughts in your mind and just that idea that that you're, we should have a much tighter filter on what goes into our brains and what goes into our minds and the power our thoughts have over us. And I think that's one of the things that illus- that Inception does a great job of talking through is the importance of the ideas that exist in your mind and the stories we tell ourselves about our lives and about what happens. Yeah, I think sometimes we can believe uh, something that's completely wrong or incorrect Mm -hmm. they talk about that in inception with he says uh eem says you start with the relationship with the father Mm -hmm. you know that's where you build out um the idea of what you want the person to do because that's not the big idea of you should take this action it's the what's the motivation behind the action yeah um but if you spend your whole life living uh, believing something that's incorrect, it can destroy you. And I think of another movie you saw recently that is the whole premise of the movie, I think, is The Northman, mm, yeah. um, where the boy goes away believing that uh, his uh, father's brother killed him and stole his mother against her will and uh, spends his whole life trying to get back to get revenge and then finds out that things aren't what he thought they were. And it just kind of devastates him Mm -hmm. um, in an instant. Um, It's, and you see that in some other movies too, how you just, you think Mm -hmm. one thing your whole life growing up and it's the one thing you're pursuing or trying to overcome. And then it turns out that that thing is not what you thought. Yeah. It was, and it can just change everything instantly. And I think this is what makes Nolan such a good director is he knows how to get both the idea and the premise to its, to its deepest root while still maintaining the emotional aspect of that. And, and I, I just enjoyed that, that sense. I mean, this is a heist movie, but that, that they would, that he put in that scene where they would stop and just talk about, okay, we actually do have to think about what we're doing here. And of course, that winds up being a huge part of the premise of of the story, the backstory between him and his wife is the idea of what happens when you plant an idea in someone's mind. And and too much, we just let so many things drift into our minds and and we don't do a good job of of thinking through exactly what we're allowing in our minds all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the the scene in in Inception where um where you see him in the hospital room with his dad in the middle of this uh ice fortress collapsing yeah just incredibly powerful i don't want to completely spoil um 
in case anyone out there has not seen Inception, then you go had see 12 that. years, man. You've had 12 years. Right now. Go see it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. What do you, what do you got, Rob? Um, so I just, there, there's been a lot of controversy around um, Top Gun Maverick in the sense that uh, it being a war movie that uh, repre- is representative of the American Navy fighter pilots. Um, in, in order to make a movie like this, in order to have access to the equipment and such to f- film this accurately, you have to sign like contracts with the Department of Defense and stuff. Basically, say like you're not going to make the U.S. look stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is like, can you can you make a movie that is honest and not just propaganda, um, utilizing that kind of structure? And I would uh, my argument is that I think that out of all the movies I've seen that have this kind of association or tie in, I think Top Gun Maverick, I think one of the reasons why it's doing so well actually is I think it might be one of the most apolitical mm-hmm. movies I've seen. I think it's about as apolitical as you can get when it comes to a movie about a fighter pilot. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's not, it's never about a specific other country that they're fighting. Like they, they never really say like what the country is other than some, very broad character characteristics of it um it's really to me the story is much more about him hence the name of the movie yeah than, than it is about um glorifying the military in fact i would argue that i think it's pretty clear in this movie that the idea of being comfortable with um soldiers or pilots going overseas and dying is seen as and represented as a bad thing like um the one scene in particular um maverick says he's not okay with you know someone not coming home um and i i think that there have been other movies where it might have been like glorified you know to go off and die for your country in battle is the highest reward um it's actually a quote from i don't know the latin but it's a quote from the kingsman movie that came out recently Mm -hmm. um at the one soldier's funeral um his father reads that quote ray fine's character reads that quote and basically says like for shame you know to the military industrial complex of the time in britain um so it's a fine. I think it's a fine line. I I don't think that we're anywhere near like where Nazi Germany was when it comes to like um, propagandizing the military or conflict. But I think there is a danger there uh, that you want to be honest about what's actually happening um, and not necessarily like encourage people hey this will be your awesome life like if you become a pilot yourself you can be top gun maverick i really i didn't feel like that was the point of the movie um but there's been a lot of criticism surrounding it with that being said so i was just curious what your thoughts are on that too well i would say i would say a it is it is a relatively a political movie um, it really is. And I think some of the controversy is just because it's not political. And I think that's how far movies have fallen in such a way where, where a movie that strives to tell a relatively accurate picture is seen as controversial. Um, I do also think there is a difference between patriotism and propaganda. I think it's, it should be perfectly okay to say positive things about your own country or your own military without that being controversial. And there, and, but there is a difference. There is a difference in like lying about it mm-hmm. or, or misleading people about it. Um, but I don't think it's, 
I don't think it's problematic necessarily to show people in heroic light or, or even show the military in a heroic light. I, th I think there's, there's a place for that. And there's, I think there's, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, so I do think there is a difference between um, propagandizing and um, just patriotism. And I, there can be a fine line and it can run on certain directions. Uh, it can also run in the opposite direction too, where, where in order to try and not do that, that you paint an overly negative picture. And I think we've seen that a number of times too. Mm -hmm. so, All right. All right. So that is a round of movie philosophizing. Uh, now we'll go to another segment, which uh, we've kind of done, but didn't really have a name. Uh, so it's movies, but not movies. This is something that we can talk about that's adjacent to movies, but gives us more flexibility in terms of like, it doesn't have to be about a specific movie or anything along those lines. Uh, so it really is a wider swath of options. Uh, so Rob, what you got? Well, first of all, the most important question, you probably asked us in the podcast way at the beginning of this podcast, but what's, what's your go-to theater food? Mm. Let me say, what's your go-to theater food that is technically allowed? And what's your go-to theater food that is not allowed? <laughs> uh, so, uh, Don't cancel me, Regal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am a popcorn guy when it comes to movies. I like, I like my popcorn. I like having, I like having it. I'm usually done with it by the time the trailers are done <laughs> because I'm just munching it down like crazy. Uh, but yeah, I'm a big popcorn guy when it comes to, when it comes to regular stuff. Um, one story though, for, uh, not strictly legal movie food for a while, uh, the Regal near, near my house has a, a McDonald's in the same complex. And what I used to do is like go in and buy like the $1 McChickens and I would stuff them in my pockets and I would walk into the theater and eat McChickens in, in the, in the theater. Uh, so that was, uh, that was, that was a, a non, non-sanctioned food that I, that I would regularly do for a little while. That is hilarious because that is directly tied into my response, which is that, uh, when I went and saw the King's daughter with, uh, my best friend, Jen, uh -huh. we, uh, may have each gotten, uh, two cheeseburger meal and eaten one cheeseburger in the parking lot and the other one halfway through the movie. Nice. And I just have to say that was the highlight of seeing the King's daughter. Nice. I think <laughs> my, I don't know if you remember, like Swedish fish used to come in this box that was like, mm -hmm. like an inch and a half high and like five inches wide. Yeah. My brother, and it was like, there was like a plastic bag inside with all the fish in it. And my brother managed to sneak that entire bag into a movie theater once. I think it was like bulging like out from his shirt. And it was like, I don't know how he got away with it, but he, he, he did. As far as, uh, you know, at the theater, I do like popcorn. I know Ryan eats his popcorn without butter. Yes, um, I, I like my popcorn with butter, so I don't get it very often. And uh, uh, my, my, my favorite theater food is snow caps. Oh, without a doubt. And the sad part about that is Regal does not have snow caps. Oh, okay. So, but Regal does have Mountain Dew, which, you know, yeah. I guess balances out the equation. <laughs> um, but South York Cinema out here, the discount theater does have snow caps. So whenever I go over there, I get them. And they're also cheaper than like the regular theater nice. candy. So, yeah, nice. every once in a while, I'm tempted to go to the, you know, you can get them at the dollar store mm -hmm. <laughs> for a dollar yeah and i just have this I, I it's it's stupid and i probably shouldn't care but i i for some reason when it comes to the theater candy i have this like little moral voice that is like don't sneak candy <laughs> in the theater and the one time i thought about doing it my wife said is that really the example you want to set for your kids and that yeah. you know that's just unfair yeah, but, uh, is the example for the yeah. kids thing oh, the kids. yeah i this kind of ties in uh to something i was going to say about this too and but uh do you do you know the candy sour jacks mm -hmm. uh i like them better than sour patch kids and blockbuster video used to get there you'd be like a plastic tub of these things that they would sell the sour jacks at blockbuster and i used to get them on a regular basis when 
uh, we were in college and I was going back and forth to Blockbuster. I had their movie pass. And for whatever reason, I can like not find these things anywhere. Like every once in a while, I'll go to a store and I'll find them and I'll buy them there. And then every time I go to the store after that, like they're out. Like it's it's like whatever they had left, they sold to me. And then like, there's just no replacement. So I've been running into all kinds of problems finding Sour Jacks. And I was really, really hoping at some point that I could get some of these things. But uh, alas, it does not seem to, it does not seem to be in the cards. I don't know if they're, they don't make them anymore or if they're just scarce. I'm not sure what's going on, but that was, that's like something I associated with movies that has, has disappeared. Yeah. Completely unrelated um, to this discussion. Another thing I was thinking about is the blending of TVs and movies that we're starting to see, particularly mm. in the, in the Marvel universe, how, yeah you're starting to see aspects of the tv shows Mm -hmm. come over into the movies or things happen in the tv shows that are references to the movies yeah um i i think that i think that this may be you know aided or pushed a bit by the whole streaming model too yeah i think you're getting more access to things in a way that when when it came to things just being on tv shows you either saw it when it happened or you would have to wait several months to see it. And so I think it was harder for things to be connected. Things were more um, disparate. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think now that you have the streaming model where, you know, you can keep these things up for however long um, it's much easier to connect them to movies that are coming out. Mm -hmm. And we actually saw that in Dr. Strange There are actually a couple of characters that showed up in the movie that were first introduced in the tv show what if Mm -hmm. and the reaction to them was very positive in the when i saw it the opening weekend the reaction to that was you could tell the people knew who these people were Mm -hmm. or even or even like the general premise and storyline was directly tied into one of the tv shows Mm -hmm. um and I think, I think you see that for some positive and for some negative, like um, it's starting to come out, like the amount of content that you will have to have consumed via Marvel to be able to keep up with them at this point is just stacking up and stacking up. Um, I had, I had something on, along similar lines, but um, I, I am not particularly hopeful that amazon will do a good job with their lord of the Rings series mm. um i know they're putting a huge amount of money into it they're putting a huge amount of of weight behind it um i just don't trust amazon that they're going to do a good job <laughs> um I, i'm yeah this is i mean it's another crossover where you're basically pulling an entire movie audience across uh into a streaming world and hoping that they hoping that they take the bait um i know a lot of people are very intrigued i mean it's a storyline that is really was really interesting storyline um basically about the about the the rings that led up to the one ring uh which i think is really fascinating but it really does I, I just don't know. Like, I, I love the movies. Peter Jackson did an unbelievable job. I'm just concerned that Amazon is going to screw this up. Um, so I do think there is some trepidation or concern from people based on the fact that even though they weren't awful movies, the Hobbit movies were not up to the standard of yeah. the original three Lord of the Rings movies. So since that is the last thing that people remember, um, I think there's a lot of doubt because of that too. Yeah. Um, so my other one is very similar too. Is I, I, I didn't even put it on there. The, the, the Amazon did do a good job with the Reacher series. Um, Jack Reacher character um, from the Lee Child novels. Also Tom Cruise did two movies based on the, the Lee Child character, Jack Reacher. Uh, I like that the Reacher character looks a lot more like what he does in the books. He's supposed to be 265, 250, which Tom Cruise is not 6'5", 250. Um, but it's cool because this this series is they're they're just taking each novel 
and I'm going to do a season based on each of the novels, which I think is a fun way to do it. It's not quite what they did with Bosch, um, where Bosch, they kind of mixed and matched storylines uh, from the different books. Uh, they had one overarching, but they would pull inside from other, other novels. I like this just going straight through with each season being a different book, which, which I think is a fun way to do it. Yeah, I actually have not seen any of the Reacher series or movies, so I probably need to watch some of those. The first movie is actually really well done. Um, I think it was marketed very poorly, uh, but it was really well done. I think they kind of butchered the second one, having read the book. I think they kind of butchered the second one a little bit, uh, but the series is good. Yeah. All right, you got anything else for movies but not movies? I do not. I'm ready to talk about movies I watch. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, watch list, movies you watched this week. What'd you watch, Rob? So I saw Thor, Love and Thunder. I'm not nice. going to say too much about it because I don't want to spoil anything. We'll um, do a full breakdown next week. I, I'll i say uh, just as a broad thing that uh, it was very interesting seeing the transitions between tone in this movie. Mm. Um. I was I was very I was surprised by how the movie started. I won't say anything more than that. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, all of the humor from Taika Waititi. Again, it was it was really good. Um, I also saw Minions: The Rise of Gru. Um, and I've seen all of the Minions movies and all the Despicable Me movies because I have kids. <laughs> and to me, I just think that this was the least impressive of them okay i don't think it lived up to the standard of the ones they've done before mm -hmm. and maybe it's just because there's only so many things you can say about giant anthropomorphic tic tacs <laughs> true <laughs> but uh yeah i just it didn't really do much for me um i mean my kids loved it they thought it was yeah. hilarious it's like um and I've liked some of the other ones, so it's not that I don't like the concepts, just that I didn't see a whole lot in this one. Um, and then the third movie, I actually watched a movie um, at home the other night. I watched The Watch hmm. with uh, Vince Vaughn and Ben Stiller and Jonah Hill. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one. Richard Aode. Um, and I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was a really good movie. Yeah. Um, it's just a funny, goofy comedy about four guys who come together and decide to start watching over their neighborhood um, because someone gets killed in the Costco. And it turns out there's aliens in the town and then <laughs> it gets weirder and weirder from there. And there are some definitely quite disturbing scenes in it, but there's also some really funny stuff in it too. So not a kid's movie at all by any stretch. <laughs> Um, definitely uh, uh, an adult R-rated movie, <laughs> but I found it funny, and I don't necessarily find a whole lot of R-rated comedies funny. So, yeah, uh, the watch I thought was pretty good. Uh, so I watched uh, the movie Mr. Jones. I believe it was on Amazon Prime. Um, really fascinating movie about um, it's about a reporter who starts looking into. Um, it takes place, I believe, in the 1950s. Let me let me look it up specifically. Um, and uh, this came out in 2019. James Norton and uh, Vanessa Kirby, Peter Sarsgaard, uh, 1930s, actually, sorry, 1930s. And basically, it's um, right when the Soviet communists were really trying to make a push to say, hey, this is this is the wave of the future. Communism is the wave of the future. And this reporter, Mr. Jones, is, he's from, uh, I think he's from Wales. And he starts looking into, uh, he's like, their numbers of this stuff that they say they're doing don't add up. Maybe I should go investigate. And so he goes over to Russia and he meets with um, Walter Durante, who's played by Peter Skarsgård, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, I think for the New York Times at the time. And this is based on true story. And basically he, he finds out that 
all of basically all the all the media over there are basically being lap dogs for the for the for the Soviet communists and not reporting on anything that's actually going on there. So he actually sneaks into the Ukraine. And what he finds there is that the, the Soviet government is literally starving, starving out the people of Ukraine. Uh, what we know from history is that probably close to 10 million people died in the starvation. Uh, but basically, he's trying to report the truth. And then Walter Duranty is actively uh, towing the Soviet line on this. And, and it became a battle of newspapers uh, as to... Uh, he comes back and is reporting what's going on in the Soviet Union, and and Walter Durante is writing columns saying everything's great and everything's fine. And there's there's a couple references to George Orwell in there and his writing of Animal Farm, which was about the uh, which was basically an allegory about the Soviet Union and how Mr. Jones was kind of one of the people who helped convince him as to what was going on. Um, it's a really interesting movie, and I think. The, the good parts of the movie is it talks about like what happened in that time frame and like how on earth uh, did so many of the media people just go along with what was going on in, in communist Russia. Uh, but one thing that like you could tell it was a lower budget film because when he goes into Ukraine, like the scale of the devastation is not as like, they weren't able to give it the, the type of scale that it needed. They had to do it in small moments and in small instances, uh, which I think they did a good job with, but it just, it did not accurately portray the scale of everything that was happening in those moments. Uh, but there's some interesting philosophy behind this. Maybe I'll save this one for a, for a different philosophizing one about the, the differences between our understanding of the the dangers of Nazism versus communism. All right. All right. Well, that is all we have in store for you for the Film for Fans podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Check out filmforfans.com and check back with us next week where we will do a full breakdown of Thor, Love and Thunder. Until next time, enjoy the movies.